Welcome back, everybody, to part two of our review lecture on Jane Eyre. This section of the video is going to focus pretty exclusively on the figure of Bertha Mason in Jane Eyre. It's going to take us into some literary criticism territory. It's going to introduce us to some new terms to do with character pairings and character analysis. Um, some of the, the reading or interrogating that we're going to do here basically falls under the, the umbrella or the, the label of post-colonial theory, really kind of deconstructing the narrative with a lens to the influence of colonial systems and prejudices. Um, we're going to look at control of information, limited character perspective, the psychological elements of this novel. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to make you mad. Buckle up. Um, so, it's a common device in literature for an author to craft character pairings that produce opportunities for comparison, such that in looking at the paired characters together, a reader can achieve a deeper and more nuanced understanding of each one of those two characters than would be possible to get at just at, by looking at them in isolation, right? By, by holding them up together, you understand each of them individually a bit more deeply. Um, there are two commonly used terms when talking about character pairings in literature. I, so there are lots of there are lots of terms, but there are two big ones for our purposes today. And I apologize for the the slight instability of my camera. That seems to be just how it is today. A foil. There's your word foil. F O I L. A foil is a character who serves to draw attention to the qualities of another character, frequently. The protagonist, not always, but frequently the protagonist. Foil pairings reveal information and illustrate traits, values, or motivations of one character by comparison and contrast with another character. These um, almost pre-planted comparisons offer ready avenues to deeper understanding of both the two characters in the foil pairing by emphasizing their respective strengths and weaknesses, or by putting their actions and choices into context, thus illuminating their deeper motivations. Um, when I was sort of looking for quick examples of this online, so as not to reinvent the wheel, I found that literarydevices.net offers a really nice illustration from one of our previous course texts, Frankenstein. Quote, in Frankenstein, Mary Shelley utilizes the creature as a foil for his creator, Victor Frankenstein. Frankenstein isolates himself from others to pursue his obsession with creating a living being, and then he abandons his creation and all responsibility. On the other hand, the creature Frankenstein, or sorry, the creature Frankenstein creates, the, the monster, searches for companionship and connection with others as a result of his creator's rejection and abandonment, but that search for unity leads to violence and destruction. I'm paraphrasing slightly here just to make sure that it's clear for you guys because hearing and reading are not always the same. This contrast between Frankenstein and his foil, the creature, emphasizes the humanity that Frankenstein, as in Dr. Frankenstein, lacks as a character, and calls attention to the reader's own capacity for connection, understanding, and mercy. It's an example of a foil pairing. Now there are lots of foil pairings available for examination in this novel, Jane Eyre. Most of them between Jane and others who are set up as meaningful counterparts of hers. Uh, Jane and St. John Rivers, Jane and Rochester, St. John, or St. John, as it's sometimes pronounced, and Mr. Brocklehurst, who, who was in charge of the, the school at Lowood when Jane was a child. All available foil pairings in this novel. But Bertha Mason is quite possibly the most important foil that Charlotte Bronte has set up for Jane in this novel. And I'd like to discuss that pairing, as well as Bertha a bit more independently for the rest of this second half of our review lecture. One specific type of foil pairing that features heavily in almost any Gothic or Neo-Gothic literature, like Jane Eyre, Neo-Gothic, is the double. 
or sometimes doppelganger. They're not, they're not perfect uh, synonyms, but they are related terms. I've posted a really good fulsome definition of this, of, of the character double, to the Files tab on Populi. Uh, so do check that out, along with a supplementary article called Plain Jane's Progress. Uh, by Gilbert and Gubar that talks a lot about the ways that Bertha Mason operates as an important double for Jane. I've highlighted the relevant sections, so it's a very quick read. Don't worry about it. Um, do check that out. Um, but I will just quote from that, that definition of the character double uh, briefly here to get at one point that I think will be particularly important for our discussion of Bertha, since I'd like this thread to take us in a bit of a decolonizing, race-conscious direction since the realities of colonialism, slavery, and racism are really important inequalities that kind of haunt this book about fighting inequality, about overstepping systemic inequalities. And, and these racial colonial inequalities haunt the book kind of from off scene a lot of the time. They are present, deeply present, but in these shadowy yet critical ways, and they sometimes don't get addressed enough in classroom discussion of the book, I think. So I'm just, as I said, going to quickly quote from that definition that I've given you. Um, Often, seemingly disparate characters are shown through doubling to be fundamentally similar, hence collapsing the self-other dichotomy and imparting a worrying sense of indistinguishableness between the supposed opposites. This implies that boundaries between deliberately demarcated groups of people or individuals are actually slippery and unstable. External identity markers such as dress and mannerisms are hence undependable, allowing social categories to become permeable and vulnerable to transgression by virtue of their easy imitation. Doubling hence illustrates deep anxieties explored in the Gothic regarding the weakening of the distinctions drawn along lines of class, gender, race, and nationality, posing threats to the interests of the self. It also raises a cautionary point that a thin line separates good and evil and while it is easy for evil to infiltrate one's protected sanctum, it is equally easy for one to fall into the latter's trappings. As such, everything that seems good must also be held in suspicion of harboring a negative or compromised underside. That is part of our definition of doubles that should illuminate our discussion here and your um, your own sort of follow-up from here on the relationship between Jane Eyre and Bertha Mason. The Sparknotes study guide on Jane Eyre points out that Jane's allusions to a feeling of madness or insanity in chapter 27, that's during her sort of personal and spiritual crisis as she struggles to tear herself away from Rochester, having discovered that he's married, the Sparknotes writers suggest that these allusions to a feeling of, of madness or insanity really bring out parallels between Jane and Bertha Mason, such that, quote, it is possible to see Bertha as a double for Jane, who embodies what Jane feels within, especially since the externalization of interior sentiment, feeling, or thought is a trait common to the Gothic no gothic novel, which is true. And all of that is very much what this uh, Gilbert and Gubar Plain Jane's Progress article deals with. So as I said, do have a, have a look. Um, so from here, I will ask by way of a reflection question, what do you think the idea of, what do you think of the idea of Bertha as a kind of double for Jane? as a, a kind of emblematic doppelganger. In what ways is this a fruitful line of examination that enriches the novel and our understanding of it? On the other hand, what might we lose from this story if we think of Bertha mainly as Jane's symbolic double, 
rather than thinking of her as herself. Minor character though she is, limited though our access to her perspective is. A person with her own distinct history, humanity, rights, and dignity, her own light to throw on the plot that we receive primarily through Jane's and Rochester's perspectives. Chapter 27 contains just about the whole sordid history of Mr. Rochester's relationship with Bertha Mason and what he knows or believes of her personal backstory. Everything that Jane and we as readers know about Bertha comes through Rochester. And that's important for us to recognize in analyzing this text because it should prompt us to acknowledge the limits, the reasonable and predictable limits, prejudices, and blind spots in that perspective, Rochester's perspective. And thus, to read a little more carefully, dig into details, interrogate gaps and ellipses, read between the lines to see if there is a different or more fulsome story to be heard about Bertha's character. You know, something in there, but only in a shadowy way, kind of haunting the text. That's the line of inquiry that I'd like to unpack for the last bit of our time together. So all of what's about to follow in terms of my, my quoting, kind of the info that we have on Bertha Mason, as I said, comes from chapter 27. So if you'd like to sort of dig in and follow along with me, that's the place where you're going to be able to find this stuff. Rochester tells us that Bertha comes from Jamaica. I should say it's interesting to note that geographical locations that are somehow important or importantly enmeshed in the transatlantic slave trade feature in both Rochester's and Jane's backstory. When Jane finds out that she has this uncle who's left all his property to her and made her wealthy, he lives on a little island that belongs to Portugal, is somewhere off the coast of Portugal, and would have been a fairly significant point in the conduct of the transatlantic slave trade and exchange of, of luxury goods that went back and forth between shipments. Um, again, that's a detail about Jane's story that it, it's just sort of dropped there and very little explained. We don't know what the nature of Jane's uncle's work is. We only know that he's made his fortune in this unconventional place that has some pretty known explicit connections to the slave trade and that that appears in a book which is already so meaningfully haunted by transatlantic traffic and and wealth and abuses of power and and sort of colonial goings on rochester tells us that bertha came from jamaica her father, Mr. Mason, was, quote, a West India planter and merchant. You should know, planter here means plantation owner, which pretty much means we can be fairly sure that Mr. Mason, Bertha's father, was a slave owner. It, like, it's pretty much inevitable that he is a slaver. So, that's critical information right there. Rochester also mentions that Bertha's mother was, quote, a Creole. And this basically means a person of mixed heritage, usually part West African um, and part French or Spanish, different sort of colonial lineages, maybe even Native American in there somewhere. So we're, we're essentially talking about a native Jamaican woman of, of mixed ethnographic descent, who almost certainly has slavery in her recent family history. This Creole woman is the wife, whatever exactly wife may or may not mean in this context of Jamaica and the frontier in the 19th century. This Creole woman is the wife of Mr. Mason, the West India planter and slave owner. So just at even a surface examination of things, that's some emotionally effed up business right there. That is messy, messy, messy. And, and like God only knows what's gone into the makings of that situation. Moving along. 
It is reported, again by Rochester, um, but I think that he has this information mainly at second hand. It's reported that Bertha's mother was crazy or mentally ill and drunk. In fact, at the time that Rochester marries Bertha, 15 years before our story, we learn that Bertha's mother was locked up in an asylum in Jamaica, just as her daughter, Bertha Antoinetta Mason, will be locked up in four short years in the top floor of Rochester's house at Thornfield Hall. Now, think about all of this together for a minute. Yes, mental illness is a real thing. And yes, mental illness can run in families. That's a possibility here. We are told that Bertha's younger brother was significantly mentally compromised as well, and, and him from a young age, as opposed to Bertha and her mother, it seems to have been an adult onset of, of their disturbances. Um, these are very real factors. But what about trauma? Ask yourselves, what was her history, Bertha's mother? How did she come to be this man's wife, and what did that cost her mentally and emotionally? Could it be that she had perfectly sane reasons for being emotionally or even psychologically disturbed or prone to drink? Take that down a level to our contemplation of Bertha Mason herself, the, uh, the classic mad woman in the attic. This is the mixed race daughter of a slaver father and a broken native J Jamaican mother, evidently ill and addicted, possibly self-medicating, we're talking about mum here, and this young woman, Bertha, is basically made into a mail-order bride f by the mas machinations of men, you know, her, her father and her older brother, for a fiancé in another country whom she has never met or even corresponded with, namely Edward Fairfax Rochester. And Rochester himself admits that while he was infatuated with her beauty when he first met her, he never loved, never esteemed, did not even know her when he agreed to marry her, chiefly because he needed the money from her dowry. And then, after a very short period of time in, living in Jamaica, in which he already realized that she was not doing well, he tears her away from everything she's ever known, her home country, her family, her culture, drags her all the way across the world, across the wide Sargasso Sea, to England. Completely different culture, completely different climate, completely different food, completely different everything, and very different prejudices as to women like her. What would the effects of that be? Rochester says, quote, Her family wished to secure me, as a husband for her, because I was of a good race, and so did she. What the devil kind of inculcated racism does this reflect? This was a desirable partnership because it took a beautiful woman of compromised but aspiring family and married her off to a white man who would advance her status and respectability in the world through his whiteness and presumably the whiteness of whatever babies they might have. And her substantial dowry or bride money made it worth his while to do so. There's a point in the novel where Jane talks about how she believes that Rochester doesn't love Blanche Ingram and indeed scorns her and doesn't consider her his equal, but that he's going to marry her anyway. And she says, I would scorn such a union and that makes me better than you. She has contempt for such a choice. How much worse, how much more complicated, how much uglier this story of Bertha Mason's history how does this information impact your perception of Bertha's madness, of her character? How does it impact your perception of Rochester, the way he speaks about her in chapter 27 and, and other places, the way that he treats Bertha throughout the novel? And I should say, I'm not suggesting this should completely destroy your sense of Rochester and that he's an evil man. I'm just asking, how does all this information complicate or change or renovate your perception of Bertha 
and of Rochester and of the whole arrangement of, of what's going on at Thornfield Hall. For one last point, if you enjoyed this novel and if this business about the racial transatlantic features of Bertha's backstory really interest you in terms of how they reshape and recolor this, this other brilliant novel that is Jane Eyre, there's, there's a story written in 1966, another novel by an author called John Rhys, that spends its whole text imagining and laying out Bertha's story from her own perspective. From the beginnings in Jamaica, through her marriage to Rochester, the crossing to England, her descent into madness, the whole period of her confinement at Thornfield Hall, right up until the point where she escapes her room that final time and, and ultimately burns down the mansion. That novel, that imaginative post-colonial novel by John Rhys, is called The Wide Sargasso Sea. Thank you all so very much for your patience and attention this week as we've made our way through some very long and very dense texts. I do hope that it's been rewarding for you and that you find yourself with plenty to chew on. Do remember that writing really is the best way there is to entrench your learning on just about anything. So if Jane Eyre really captured your imagination, if you have burning questions or ideas you'd like to pursue in this novel, that is an excellent clue that you should be thinking about doing your final paper on it, especially because to put in that further effort to really entrench your learning, you know, it, it pays you back for the time that you spent reading a very, very long book. It, it sort of, you know, does justice to the, the effort put in already. Um, that said, there's lots more coming up on our course that might interest you, but I, I want to get you thinking about the final paper. And I'm always happy to chat ahead of time about any ideas that you might have on that score. Go get some sunshine. I'll see you Monday.